The first polls on Super Tuesday will be closing in about 30 minutes, but we're already getting a look at how some voters feel. Our CBS News exit polling has found that so far, 63% of Super Tuesday primary voters say they prefer a nominee who can beat President Trump. That's compared to 34% of Democratic primary voters who'd rather see a candidate who agrees with them on major issues. At the end of the day, though, 83% of Democratic primary voters today say they will support the Democratic nominee no matter what. For more, let's bring in Antoine Seawright and Leslie Sanchez. Antoine is a CBS News political contributor and Democratic strategist. And Leslie is a CBS News political analyst and Republican strategist. Good to see you both again. Antoine, <laughs> let's start with you and this exit poll about how 63 percent of primary voters say it's more important to them that a candidate defeat President Trump than agree with them on issues. What does that say about the state of the race on this Super Tuesday? It says to me that voters have been consistent about what their priorities are. This number has been consistent every single primary and even before the primary season started. So what that also says to me is people understand you cannot govern if you do not win and losers do not legislate. Therefore, if we can get across the finish line first as Democrats, we can figure out the policy agenda it will take uh, in order for us to really soothe the ears and concerns of the American people. And I think primary candidates have to keep this in mind and not get caught up in the bubble conversation, Elaine, because no matter the differences we appear to have as Democrats, they certainly do not compare to the differences we have with Donald Trump and the Republican Party. And I think voters are demonstrating that in their participation in this, pro in this process at record numbers. Uh, Leslie, our CBS News exit polling also found 69 percent of voters said they feel angry with the Trump administration. So just how big a factor is President Trump in this primary race? It's, he's a big activation point, no doubt, on the left. You see so many more candidates getting in. You're seeing the progressive, you know, we talked about this Democratic Socialist insurgency in the Democratic Party, meaning the Bernie Sanders effort. And it's, it's had so many people trying to figure out how to defeat the president versus understanding why people supported the president. And that came up a few times in the debate by some of the centrist candidates who were saying, you have to understand what the frustration was by so many disaffected voters who were frustrated with many of the Obama policies, who were frustrated by lack of border enforcement and security. They'd lost faith in public and private institutions, especially after the economic downturn of 2008. There was a lot of frustration in the country, so putting America first and prioritizing that was what really wrangled a lot of disparate groups together. And I don't see anything yet that's talking to that. You have to have, when you're talking about this type of leadership style, you have to match it with leadership style. And that's really where the contest comes down to. Antoine, from your perspective, what do you make of that figure? 69% of Democratic voters saying they feel angry with the Trump administration. Is that something um, that you would expect at this point in the Democratic primary contest? How do you think that could manifest itself? Elaine, in elections, there are several things that drive people or fuel them, uh, anger, uh, frustration, or dissatisfaction um, from what they've been getting. And I think many people who voted for Donald Trump in 2016 um, feel like the president has not only let them down, but have failed them on the policy agenda he promised them that will ultimately improve their quality of life. And so we're seeing the disinfected voters that Leslie uh, oftentimes referred to uh, really go back to the Democratic side who voted for Barack Obama in 2016. And when you look at the political concrete of this party, African-American voters, not only are they angry, angry, they feel like we've gone full steam backwards in some of our communities because while Republicans try and uh, do victory laps about things are so good for people of color, most of us will argue um, that things have not, not only gotten uh, not only good, but they've gotten worse in some cases. Uh, Leslie, let's talk about the delegate rich state of Texas, your home state, uh, poised to award 228 pledged delegates. The demographics of that state, ha as you know, have been changing so much so the Democrats have talked about for months now turning <laughs> that red state blue. Um, give us a sense of what, you know, the demographic reality is and also the fact that the Latino vote in particular 
is not a monolithic vote. We've talked about the generational divide that exists in that population. Sure, you have a lot of Trump supporters in Texas uh, who are Latinos uh, and second, third generation individuals. It, it, it's very different. I always think back to last election, Bernie Sanders won Travis County, a lot of that area in, in Austin, mm -hmm. which has a lot of California transplants that come over there. And it's a tech sector, a music sector, very entrepreneurial. Um, and just a, kind of a little keep Austin weird. It's a little different from the rest <laughs> of the conservative part of the state. Democrats have been talking about this for a long time, that it's going to be this big wave. But the types of Democrats that win in Texas are conservative Democrats. They believe in free trade. You think of members like Henry Cuellar, who is a, a Texas member on the border, who's a Democrat, who the ACLU, uh, the unions went against him and continue to get, go against him for his votes on trade. So it's a very different type of formula. But Texas is so unique because of what was learned in 2016 by the Sanders campaign. They lost to Hillary Clinton. Same case can be made in California, where it was really California came in after the fact. Hillary Clinton basically won enough delegates to be the nominee. But Bernie Sanders learned that Spanish advertising, working on the ground, building those coalitions, making that introduction would have a payoff, and he never stopped campaigning. That's why I want us to pay attention tonight to California, Texas, North Carolina, where they're deploying the same type of tactics, tactics and activating not just young voters, but Latino voters who are, who are voting many times for the first time. Hmm. Well, Antoine, you wrote an opinion piece about Super Tuesday, arguing that, quote, March will be full of political madness. What do you mean by that? <laughs> well, I just think that while some people think that thing, the score will be settled tonight about who is likely on their pathway uh, to be our nominee, I probably disagree. Uh, with the stakes so high and so many delegates up for grab, I think that we will have some clarity, but the window would not be clear, clear enough where we can see our way through this entire process. And so, therefore, it's on to the third leg of this race, the March 10th, 10th leg of this race. And so, you know, we're in the basketball season of March Madness. As you know, I oftentimes put sports and politics together. <laughs> yes, you so do. we're going to experience political March Madness, Elaine, starting tonight. All right. Uh, well, do you think that the remaining campaigns are prepared, Antoine, for this, quote, March Madness to begin? I think some of them are. You know, I've been very clear, and I think I wrote this in my piece. Um, the primary process is a marathon, not a sprint, and direction is more important than speed. And the best campaign campaigns and the best candidates will demonstrate their ability to take a licking and keep on ticking. And to this point, that's been Bernie Sanders and Joe Biden. We will be tested tonight, or Michael Bloomberg will be tested tonight for the first time, so we will see his political durability and how flexible he is in this primary process. You know, Antron brings a really good point when he's talking about Bloomberg with respect to that. And I was just looking at the numbers. You know, Hillary Clinton's campaign, the ex expenditures were $1.2 billion. And we stood aghast. It was a billion-dollar right. presidential, ca you know, campaign expenditure. And, and Donald Trump was some, like, $687 million. Bloomberg alone has spent half a billion dollars, right. and we're not at Super Tuesday. Like, right. we're here today. It's astounding it the amount really of money. It is really astounding, yeah. And the impact is, are we back to 1988, for, for example, when Jesse Jackson and Al Gore split that Southern vote, right, so it allowed the left candidate, liberal candidate to move forward? That's the question. I think that's what the urgent cry is in the establishment. They don't want to be front-loaded with this. I'm telling them, putting California where it is today as opposed to further down the calendar is really going to change up that dynamic because a lot of the vote is going to be split with that Biden uh, Bloomberg effect, and especially in states like Texas where those delegates matter. Right. Um, Leslie, let's uh, talk about some down ballot races. What should Republicans uh, be watching for when it comes to these congressional and Senate contests? Because we've been talking so much about the national uh, Democratic primary here, but down ballots, some really interesting races as well. It really depends where you're looking, mm -hmm. right? So even in California, they're talking about a lot of the mix up. Daryl Issa running down there, um, right. been ducking Hunter's um, former seat. The demographics are changing, but but any areas that are along that U.S.-Mexico border still have a lot of tension with Mexico. They want to see stronger enforcement. But there's a lot more of an appetite to find a solution that works, whether it's a pathway to citizenship or legalization of some sort. And so the tone around that is really going to matter, especially when you have large amounts of, for example, Latino voters. But it down ballot, I think that's where they're sweating bullets, a Texas term in Texas, is because of Bernie Sanders at the top of the ticket and you get that push out, you're going to have a lot of people deciding they don't want to pull that country that far to the left mm -hmm. and they're going to come out for somebody like Donald Trump. Well, Antoine, your opinion piece touches on down ballot races. You say they're imperative to protecting the Democratic majority in the House. What races are you watching closely? 
I'm watching for every single last one of them. I'm especially <laughs> watching for I'm especially watching for the congressional district returns. Look, there's several things Democrats have to measure along this primary nominating process. One, the enthusiasm and turnout in the primary, because that will give us a, a nice smooth flirtation for what we could see in November. Number mm -hmm. two, we have to look at places we won in 18 and lost in 16 states and congressional districts, as well as uh, 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 legislative seats. They are so important. There are several states who are on the ballot tonight uh, in which the state houses are very close to being flipped, which is very important for the purposes of redistricting and drawing lines uh, after this 2020 election, but also some U.S. Senate seats on the ballot in some of these places that could be essential to protecting our democracy. As you know, the next president will nominate judges. The next uh, party in control of the Senate will confirm them. Those are generational things that will be on the ballot uh, and it all starts in this primary process. So I'm, I'm watching every single one of them. We have to win up and down the ballot if we want to put our fingers on the thermostat for the next genera for generations to come. All right, Antoine Seawright and mm -hmm. Leslie Sanchez, great to see you both again. Thank you. Mm -hmm.